goes to life of St. Francis and maybe get some, some explanations that someone would tell them the, the story there. And so before we, we start looking at those, the, we've got the, an art historical premise. Uh, the, the frescoes, well, yeah, we'll just pop over to the first fresco and then come back. No, so the frescoes have kind of a, a blue background to them. They're, they're, whereas uh, before this, uh, art tended to have uh, a gold background. Even though this was painted about 10 years after the frescoes, it was still in the, in the classic style of, a, of an icon, like the, the Byzantine icons are still in this style. The, the background is gold because the saints are in heaven. Uh, and so they're in heavenly glory and the gold represents that glory. And the, the icon is sort of a way of making the saints uh, present to us. So it's making present the saint as he is now in heaven, or as she is now in heaven. So here are Our Lady in, uh, in, in majesty. And perhaps we'll see this, this very uh, altarpiece when we go to, to Siena. It's in a museum now, but it used to be uh, in, the, in the cathedral. And so uh, the, these frescoes in, instead uh, are not showing the saints you know, as they now are in, in heaven as sort of an, an object of cult, something that, you know, uh, uh, to help us to pray to the saints, to, um, but rather are showing us something historical, the life of the saint. And so the, the background is a blue sky like we have here on earth, not uh, the gold that represents heavenly <coughs> glory. And this is also, you know, and so, you know, there are sort of advantages and disadvantages to each of these, these, these approaches to representing the saints. But one of the advantages to this, this new approach, which was associated with Giotto and, and, Alt and other artists of, of his time at the end of the, the, the 13th century, is that it uh, shows that the saints are, are among us. They lived on, on this earth and therefore uh, it uh, leads us, you know, it shows us more that, that we can imitate them, that we can follow their example. And so uh, we start with the, the life of, of St. Francis. St. Francis was born uh, to uh, a couple. His father was, uh, was a cloth merchant called Pietro Bernardino. His mother was called Pica. She was of, of noble birth. And uh, when he was born, the father was away on a business trip. So the his mother gave him the, the name uh, Giovanni, John. He was baptized with that name in the, in the baptismal font at, in the cathedral. If you, you go to visit the cathedral in Assisi, you can see that font where St. Francis and St. And Clair and, uh, and St. Gabriel of the Our Lady of Sorrows were all baptized. And then when his father got back from the, the, the trip, uh, he, he didn't like the name uh, John so much. He wanted, he, he had, he, so he called him, uh, he called him Francis, Francesco, no, Frances, or Francisco. No, so uh, a, a Francisco is, is sort of uh, like French, France-esque because he was a cloth merchant. He went to the, the, the fairs in, in France and, and everything in France was, was beautiful and, and culture. That was where you could get the finest cloth. That was where uh, there was beautiful music. They were building uh, beautiful cathedrals. And so you know, by calling his son France-esque or Francis, he, he wanted to, to give the idea that, that his son would, would uh, you know, pick up this, this French culture and, and have a life full of, of beauty and, and uh, and things of that sort. And so, you know, as the son of a, of a wealthy uh, cloth merchant, he, he grew up uh, somewhat worldly. Uh, he, was, he was pious. He, he always uh, gave, never, uh, or he always gave money to the poor. Uh, once he was very struck in his conscience when he failed to, to give someone money be, when they asked because he was busy uh, with a client. Uh, and so, you know, not not a, a bad person, but but a person who was who was worldly and, and not too worried about uh, about serving God. And a, a curious thing happened when he was young. So Francis is here uh, on the. Let's see. Well, it's it's my left, so it's your right. So Francis is there on the on the right with the with the halo. He's not not dressed in a in a Franciscan habit yet because he's he's still just a young man. And there's this uh, simple man who every time he, he or simple-minded man who every time he met Francis 
when they his his uh, his his clothes on the or his cloak on the ground for for Francis to to walk over. He seemed to, to reverence Francis for some reason, and, and perhaps was inspired by God uh, as uh, a sign of what Francis would would become. So that's that's the first fresco. The second one is uh, Saint Francis who trades clothes with a poor knight. So when later, this also prefigures something that that Francis would do later on. Whenever he found someone poorer than himself, since he wanted to be the the poorest of all, he would trade clothes with the poor man, uh, and because he didn't want anyone to, to outdo him in, in imitating Christ, and who chose to to be poor in order to make us rich. So you know, one day before that, you know, he was he was still the the uh, the worldly son of a cloth merchant. He he met a, a knight who was of noble birth, but uh, was had fallen on hard times and, and didn't have uh, the didn't have you know fine clothing to wear like like Francis did. So he, he traded clothes with this man, uh, which you know gave him uh, clothes that that uh, suited his dignity, and, and also uh, you know helped to. Uh, to help the want of a, of a fellow human being. So Francis uh, wanted to, to get ahead in life um, and thinking in, in worldly terms, you know, he already had, had money because he was the son of a wealthy cloth merchant. He could follow his, his father uh, in, in the trade. Uh, you know, he was very popular in the town, uh, a fun person to, to, uh, to be with at parties. And uh, he so he wanted to add to to wealth uh, nobility. So he wanted to get into the into the the noble class, and one way to do that was to be be knighted. So to get knighted, he had to do something valorous, and so he he, he decided that he would go off to to Apulia or Puglia in, in the south of of Italy, where there was a man uh, who was was uh, taking on people, and, and uh, hoped that in in the service of this man that he would become a knight. So while he was on his way there, he had a dream, and in the dream he saw a palace, and the palace was full of, of, uh, of weapons, arms, and armor, uh, and they were all marked with the sign of a cross. So he said, to whom do these belong? And he got the answer in the dream, all these things are for you and your knights. So he took this as a good sign, he was going to become a knight, and not only a knight, but he would have knights of his own. So he was definitely going to, to you know, rise in, in, in the nobility. But he didn't understand that his knights were going to be the kind that would fight spiritual battles; that they were going to be friar, or that they were going to be the the friars who were who, who would later call his knights of the Round Table. Um, and, and so he kept going toward uh, toward Puglia until he had an, another dream, in in which he, he was told Francis, you know, which is better, serving the Lord or serving a servant? Well, serving the Lord, of course. And so why are you going to serve a servant? So you know, this man, even though he's, he's noble among men, is only a servant of God. Okay, so if you really want to get ahead, you should serve the, the one who is the Lord of all. And, and so the, he was told to return home, and so he did, and he went home and, and uh, awaited our, our Lord's will. And so he would go and, uh, and pray out in the fields or, or in, in lonely in churches, and uh, one day he was praying in the church uh, of San Damiano, um, just below Assisi, and uh, it was sort of a, a run-down church, but there was still a, a priest there who celebrated Mass. It wasn't abandoned like Our Lady of the Angels was. And so he, he stopped in there to pray for the, before the crucifix, and uh, he heard a voice from the, the crucifix say, Francis, go and repair my house, which, as you see, is being all destroyed, or is all being destroyed, or is falling all into ruin. And so he took that to be the, the church that he was in. So he said, well, okay, God wants me to fix this church. Uh, so he tried to, tried to get money first uh, by, by selling some of his, his, uh, his father's uh, merchandise, uh, but the, the priest wouldn't take the money from him because he was worried about getting in trouble with the father. And, uh, and so then he, when that, that didn't work and his father got angry with him for, for, for doing this, uh, he uh, decided that he would just beg for rocks. And so he, he went and, and begged for rocks and spent his time rebuilding this church. But Christ is really talking about the church that he purchased with his blood. Before Francis worked that out, he, he went on and, 
and repaired uh, two other churches, the third of which was, was uh, the Porciuncula. So his father tried everything to, to get his son back on the, on the right path, or on the right path of worldliness, as, as he saw it. Um, he, he, uh, he dragged him, he, he, he felt that he was being made a, a laughing stock of the town by having it, by you know, his son, who who'd formerly seemed like a, a, a bright, intelligent young boy, now seemed to have gone crazy, and he was he was living out in uh, in the woods and and fixing fixing begging for rocks as if rocks were something valuable, uh, and, and so uh, tried to tried locking him up, but uh, then when he left on a on a business trip, his his mother let the let her son out, uh, and so. Uh, eventually, his father decided that uh, there was nothing more he could do to, to, to get his to fix his crazy son; that he would just disinherit him. So by now, Saint Francis was living a, a religious life, and being a religious, he was under the jurisdiction of the church. There was sort of a, a separation between church and, and state power in uh, in the Middle Ages. So to sue him, he had to go to the to the bishop's court. Uh, and so here he is in the in the bishop's court. That's the the father on the left, and, and Francis on the on the right there, half naked. Uh, and so his his father asked for everything. He wanted everything back that he'd given to Francis, and and he wanted uh, and he wanted to disinherit him. This isn't going to be my son anymore. And so you know, Francis didn't offer a defense. He he gave everything back to his father. He even gave the clothes that he was wearing, and so he wound up standing there naked. Uh, the bishop covered him with his, his cloak, uh, and Francis said, Until now I have called you Father here on earth, but now I can say without reservation, Our Father who art in heaven, since I have placed all my treasure and all my hope in him. So then up on the, on the top there's the, the, that, that hand which is sort of representing uh, God, uh, who is, is Francis's father, and, and Francis is gesturing up uh, towards that. So each of the two Two groups on the right and the left has their the uh, the supporters the the father the angry father with his angry supporters and then the, the peaceful group uh, of people the, the 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 bishop and and the others with Francis. So the bishop gives him something to wear uh, and he puts paint, draws a, a cross on it and, and then goes around uh, basically dressed as a as a hermit or as a monk for for a while. Uh, and then, uh, while he's in the Porciuncula, he has this. He, he hears the the gospel. Uh, we can talk more about that uh, in tomorrow's mass, I think. And uh, feels called to follow the the life of the apostles, the will that Christ Christ gave to the apostles. And then uh, other people gradually realize that Francis isn't crazy; he's holy, and so they start following him. Uh, and when he has a uh, Twelve followers. Then uh, Francis decides that it's time to to go ask the Pope to to approve this form of life. So they go and they they find a, a cardinal who will will get them in to to see the Pope, and they ask him uh, to to approve their their way of life. Uh, and no, the, the 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 Pope is is inclined to to do this because he had he had a, a dream. And his, in his dream, he saw the the Lateran Basilica. So that's the church on the well, on the the right there. Let's see, to your right. Yes. No, that's left. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's on on your. So that's the church on the on the left. And uh, uh, so he sees the the, the church, which it, this is uh, the the Pope's cathedral. Uh, and it's also considered the the mother of all the churches in in Christendom, uh, and so it's kind of a symbol of the church. The church is is collapsing, and what is uh, what's going to who's going to save it? And he sees this this small, humble man who suddenly uh, grows tall and and holds up the the church with his shoulder, uh, and so, you know, he recognizes uh, Francis as the the man who was in his dream, so even though the, the so there are some cardinals who object who say that the the, the way of, of total poverty that Francis wants to follow, you no know, practicing poverty in a way that that monks don't, uh, because the monks can at least have have property in in common, they can own uh, an abbey, uh, but the the Franciscans don't want to have anything 
uh, of their own, not not personally, not in common, not nothing at all. And so uh, some of the cardinals say that this is not really a rule that, that it's possible to follow. And it's, you know, maybe he's, he's just a little too enthusiastic. Uh, but then one of the other cardinals speaks up and says, well, if you, if you condemn this, you're saying that the gospel can't be lived literally. Uh, so then, you know, you're finding fault with our Lord. So the, the, so the rule is approved. And you know, so this is the confirmation of the rule that the, the uh, St. Francis and the other priors uh, before the, the Pope re receiving the, the oral, appro oral approval of their rule. Um, in, in order to, to allow the priors to, priors to preach, they're given a, a tonsure. So they're, their hair is cut, so they get these, uh, like you, you often see on, on St. Francis and the other, and other Franciscans in art. Uh, so that makes them part of the, the clergy of Rome and, uh, and that gives them permission to, to preach. So they, they come back to, to Assisi and they settle in Rivo Torto, the, the winding river. So it's a, a, another place on the plain below, below Assisi. Uh, there's a, a hut there that's big enough for them. And so you know, they, uh, they settle in that hut and that's where they are at the beginning until they decide that they ought to, until Francis decides that they ought to go back to uh, Our Lady of the Angels where everything started. Uh, and while they're there, uh, you know, St. Francis would, uh, would go out to, to pray. Uh, he went to one Sunday to Assisi to preach and uh, uh, spent the, the night there in a, in a hut praying. Uh, and while he was in the, in the hut praying uh, about midnight, uh, a fiery chariot, ca chariot came into the, into the hut where the friars were sleeping and woke them up, went through the, the, the hut three times. Uh, so then they, they understood from this that, that even though Francis was, uh, that they understood that this fiery chariot was, was Francis coming, coming through, that he was, even though he was far away uh, in the body, he was close in, in spirit and he could see what, what happened in the, in the consciences of the friars. Uh, so he would know when one of, one of them was, uh, was tempted or, uh, or needed, uh, needed help in some way. Uh, so that was, that was one thing that gave the friars you know, an, an idea that this person, that there was something very special going on among them. And another experience like that is a, a vision of, of thrones. Mm -hmm. So St. Francis and another friar were, were praying in a church one night. And the, the other friar went into ecstasy and he had a vision and he saw these, these thrones. So he had the, the thrones up there on the top. And one of the thrones was, was particularly magnificent. And he started wondering, well, whose throne could that be? And uh, he was told this, this throne uh, belonged to one of, the, one of those who fell. So there was, there was an angel that was originally for an angel, but he became a fallen angel when he sinned. And so now uh, became a devil. And so now it is reserved for the humble Francis. So it was, uh, so because of Francis's extraordinary humility, he would be, be greatly exalted. You know, the Lord lifts up the, the lowly, lifts up the humble and casts down the, the proud. Uh, so at first he didn't believe the, the truth of this vision, but then uh, afterwards, or you know, the next day or a couple of days later, he was talking with Francis and Francis, said to him, I, I think I'm the, the greatest sinner in the world. And he said, how can you say that? You can't really say that in, in truth, that you're the greatest sinner in the world. There are people who do things much worse than you do. And, and he said that, well, if God gave to, to them the graces that he's given to me, they would produce much more fruit with it. So the, the standard for, for judgment, like we had in the, in the gospel a couple of days ago, isn't the same for everyone. If you receive more, then, then more is expected of you. And because Francis had received such extraordinary graces, uh, he felt that he wasn't corresponding adequately to them, even though he was a, a great saint. He wasn't corresponding adequately to those graces and, and therefore uh, humbly considered himself the, the, the worst of all men. And, and so then the other brother you know, believed that this, that this vision really was true, that he really has had an extraordinary humility and therefore deserved to be greatly exalted. And so another of the, the many experiences uh, of the, the Franciscans in their years with Francis, uh, one day, uh, so they would go around to preach and so uh, Friar Francis and, and uh, 
and Friar Sylvester uh, were uh, were near Assisi. They were hosted uh, outside of Assisi, or not not Assisi, but Arezzo. They were hosted outside Arezzo, and when they and unfortunately, the city was was being torn by by a civil war. Uh, the, the the people in the city were fighting against one another, and, and Saint Francis saw that there were there were demons who were causing this. So he saw the demons over the city, uh, exulting, uh, in, in leaping for joy, and uh, pushing the, the people to to hate one another and, and kill one another. Uh, so he decided the thing to do was to not do anything directly himself, but uh, to do it through through Brother Sylvester. So Brother Sylvester was a very uh, simple, pure soul, and also very obedient, so he gave him the, the command uh, to go cast out the, the devils. So to go to the, told him to go to the gate and tell the, the devils to get out of the city. And so he Sylvester went, and, and he said, on behalf of Almighty God and by the command of his servant Francis, and get away from here, all you de demons. And so, uh, at once the city returned to peace, they, they settled all their problems, uh, and uh, so St. Francis saved uh, Arezzo from the, the terrible consequences of a, of a civil war. And St. Francis uh, you know, loved God very much, loved Jesus very much, and wanted, uh, and thought particularly about our Lord's Passion, and wanted to become like Christ in everything. So he wanted also to uh, to die like Christ had died. He wanted to be a martyr, and it seemed like a good way to do that would be to go go preach to them, preach Christ to the Muslims. And so one way or the other, he, either he'd convert the Muslims or he or he'd, he'd become a martyr. Uh, so that there was a good result either way. So this was was 1219. This is the hundredth anniversary of his of his trip. The the, uh, the Crusaders were there. They were they had gone there to fight and tried to to uh, to deliver the land from the from the Muslims so that pilgrims could go there uh, freely and, and the and the Christians there could could live in peace. Uh, and, and so and Francis went with the uh, went with the Crusaders and and was using a, a different kind of approach. He crossed the the lines uh, and was. You know, as soon as he got, got over there, he was captured, he asked to see the, the sultan, and, and they, they brought him to the sultan of, of Cairo, and uh, preached Christ to the, to the sultan, told him that you, know, you have to become a Christian in order to be saved, uh, but the sultan didn't seem very convinced. Uh, so he offered, well, we can do a trial by fire. I'll step into the fire, and, and you know, one of your imams can step into the fire, and the one who doesn't burn is the one who's telling the truth but he couldn't find anyone who wanted to step in the fire with him. So he said, okay, well, I'll step in the fire myself, but if I don't burn, you have to promise to become Christian. But this, the sultan wouldn't promise. So he was, the sultan was very impressed with St. Francis. He, he offered him a lot of gifts, but, but St. Francis wasn't looking for gifts. He didn't want things in this world. He wanted to save souls. And since he wasn't getting anywhere saving souls with the sultan, with, uh, in Egypt, uh, he decided to go back to Italy, and so that was the end of his attempt to become a martyr. Um, no, uh, this is a, so the next painting shows us, or the next fresco shows us an ecstasy of Saint Francis. Um, he would go to, to solitary places to pray, and, and so one uh, one night they saw him on a, the other friars saw him on a, a luminous cloud. Uh, with his his hands outstretched in the form of a cross, so the the cross of our Lord that he loved so much and that he he, he meditated and contemplated so constantly. And so the the light that they saw with their eyes is a witness to the light that was was filling the, the soul of Francis. So you know, often mystical phenomena have this sense. You know, they're they're not uh, parlor tricks, but they're trying to show us in, in some physical way that we can perceive with our senses what's going on in, in the soul of a person. You know, so there, the body of, of, of Saint Joseph is lifted up in the air to show that his, his soul is being lifted up to God, you know, for example. Uh, Saint Francis, besides being devoted to the Passion, also uh, was very devoted to the, to the Nativity and, and therefore also to, to Our Lady, uh, who made Christ our brother. And three years before he died, he decided uh, 
Christmas three years before he died, he decided to, to celebrate uh, Christmas in a, in a solemn way at, at Grecho. And this was the, the first nativity scene, the first uh, creche. Uh, so he wanted to, to reproduce it before people's eyes so that they would see what Christ did for us uh, by becoming man and, and would therefore uh, love him and, and follow him. And wanted to have the most solemn uh, Christmas possible, so there was also uh, a solemn mass. Um, the architecture in, in this, this this fresco is kind of interesting too. But well, first, we'll go with the story, and then we'll come to the architecture. Um, so he wanted to 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 reproduce the scene. He got uh, a knight, uh, Saint John of Greco, to uh, to help him and. Uh, got a live ox and a live ass, and uh, a manger, and, and with uh, with with hay that he put in front of the altar. So, you know, the this uh, on, on the right, the thing with the the, the covering of the the baldachin over it is the altar. The altars at that time were usually square, uh, and then you see Saint Francis down at the at the base of the altar, uh, picking up the the the, the baby. Uh, so you know, Saint, uh, so this night, St. John uh, said afterwards that he had seen uh, St. Francis uh, picking up and embracing a, a beautiful baby that was in the, in the crib that wasn't, that wasn't there before. Um, and so it, it seems that, that uh, you know, the child Jesus appeared to, to St. Francis in this, in this celebration of the, the Mass. So, yeah, uh, so this, this painting is interesting because it shows us the way that the, the churches were in the, at that time in the in the Middle Ages. So you've got uh, I don't know if I have a if I have something that'll work like a pointer. Yeah, try that. Pointer. Okay. So we've got uh, no so here there's a there's a choir and, and the choir is is, is singing. And they have this. This is the the stand with their their music on it. Um, the 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 sanctuary is divided from the rest of the church by this uh, iconostasis or, or rood screen. Um, and so the the rood screen is kind of no. In, in it's not an iconostasis like they have in in the Eastern churches, but where they they've covered the thing with icons. This is sort of the the original version was just a, a division. It had a, a crucifix on it. So that people could could see the the cross and think about the the cross of the think about our Lord's sacrifice of the mass. So here's the there's the the cross the, the or the rood uh, on on top of the rood screen, uh, and uh, it was basically just a, an architectural division between the sanctuary and the rest of the church. Uh, so in the in the east, uh, it got ever more decorated and, and it's now covered with a, a whole series of icons that are are put in a, in a particular arrangement. Um, in, the, in the West, after the, the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent wanted to make the Mass more accessible to people. So even though the Council of Trent hadn't said anything about destroying rood screens, uh, in lots of places they were destroyed. Uh, and you just got maybe a, a low altar rail instead of the, the high rood screen so that people could see what was going on at Mass better. Um, and in England, the, the Council of Trent didn't didn't make it there because they they'd already uh, broken with the, the Catholic Church. So so in England, the the rood screens uh, to, to a greater extent remained, uh, although you can see see them in, in some places in the the the, the, in the the Basilica of Saint Mark in Venice, for example. And then so up here we have the the pulpit, so the the preacher could could uh, could go up there and be seen by the people without the 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 rude screen getting in the way. Uh, so no, by now Saint Francis was was ill. So he asked uh, a poor man to take him up the a mountain on his donkey. I think it was Mount Laverna, but I'm not not entirely certain. I couldn't find the reference in time. So uh, no, so they're going up the mountain, and it's uh, a hot uh, hot day. And, and at one point, the man says that he, he's dying of thirst. He needs something to drink, and, but there's there's no water around. Uh, and so Fran Saint Francis causes uh, a water to to uh, 
to spring out of a out of a rock in, in a place where before there there was never water there and after there there was never water there but the the miracle uh, uh, you know, helps this this man who had helped Francis so you know, we see Francis praying and we see his companions there with the with the donkey that was carrying Francis. Now we have uh, the sermon to the birds, something that people that uh, people really like to paint for of Saint Francis. Um, and so he was uh, approaching a town called Bivania, and he found uh, a large flock of birds gathered there. And he decided, well, if all these birds have gathered, maybe I should say something to them. So he preached to them and said something like, "My, my brother birds, you should greatly praise your Creator, who clothed you with feathers, gave you wings for flight, confided." to you the purity of the air and governs you without your least care so, so thinking of what christ says about uh, the birds of the air being uh, you know god taking care of the birds of the air in, in his providence and, and so you know as saint francis would preach to the human beings that they should be grateful for for all the gifts that they've received from god you know in our case we have the redemption as a particularly great gift so he preaches to the, the birds about this, and they, they sort of seem to understand and stretch out their wings and uh, or stretch out their necks and spread their wings and and uh, you know, look at uh, look at Francis as as he's preaching, and then in the end he gives them a, a blessing and they fly away. So uh, another episode is the the death of the the knight of of Chilano. So Chilano is a town also where uh, one of Francis's first biographers came from, the, the man who wrote, the, the, the friar who wrote the first official biography was from Chilano. Uh, and so a, a knight there invited uh, Francis to, to dine with him. And so they, they lay the table and you see everything you know, laid out there on the, on the table. Uh, and Francis wanted this man to be, be repaid in some way for his kindness especially in the most important way with the salvation of his soul. Uh, and so he told them that he didn't have much time left. And, uh, the, and so the, the knight uh, confessed, he received the sacraments, and then he suddenly died to, to everyone's amazement. Uh, so you know, the, saint goes, or the, uh, the knight goes off to, uh, I don't know, perhaps to purgatory, uh, or, or to purgatory or to heaven, uh, and you see all these people here astounded at, at how suddenly uh, death can strike someone and how we should always be prepared. Yeah. So, uh, Saint Francis, the, the Pope wanted to hear St. Francis preach. And uh, so, this being a very special occasion, he's going to preach in front of the Pope, going to preach in front of all these learned cardinals, and so he tried to to prepare a learned discourse that would cite thing cite fathers and and, and the uh, and, and be and suitably impress them because these these are people who who know a lot about about theology about the fathers of the church and they're, they they need something more than than just you know, simple uh, country folk. So Saint Francis prepares this this sermon. Uh, and then uh, when he, he gets in front of the Pope, he can't remember a word of it. Uh, so, so he just says what comes to mind, and, and God inspires him, and, and, uh, and this impresses the, the Pope and the Cardinals much more than, than his attempt at a learned sermon would have done. So no, the, this is Pope Honorius III who, who approved the... Uh, the, the rule in its written form, in its definitive form. The, the other Pope, Innocent III, had approved just orally uh, a very simple kind of rule. And so at Arles in France, uh, there was a, a meeting of the friars, uh, a chapter meeting, so they were, they were there, and uh, Saint Anthony was preaching to them. He, he took the, the title on the cross, uh, Jesus Christ, the the King of, of the Jews, as his, uh, or Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and took that as, as the topic for his sermon, and he was, he was expounding it and, and citing all sorts of brilliant, brilliant things. And, and as he was preaching about the cross, uh, St. Francis uh, appeared with his arms outstretched as in a cross. And St. Francis was not in, in France, he was in Italy at the time. Uh, 
but at this great distance, he, he, he appeared and, and blessed the friars and, and then disappeared. Um, so once again, it shows St. Francis watching over, watching over all the friars and, and here having a, a miracle of, of bilocation. So, mm, yeah. so St. Francis, then two years before his death, he went up on, on Laverna where we've gone other years. It's uh, uh, on, on sort of a lonely mountain where uh, he, he would go to, to spend uh, a Lent, to spend 40 days. And he, it wasn't enough for him to have one Lent a year. He needed five or six of them. Uh, in order to, to alternate between times of, of penance and, and contemplative prayer, and uh, times of uh, and times of active active preaching, so he would sort of go to to recharge himself spiritually uh, up uh, on mountains, or or not well, not just to recharge himself, but also because what he re what he really wanted was to be united to God in in contemplation. He would go and, and preach for his neighbor's benefit. Um, but uh, what he really enjoyed was was uh, was knowing God in prayer, and so you know, while he was there, uh, he you know, a, a, a seraph appeared to him, uh, and but it was a seraph, so an, an angel, but it was a it was a crucified angel. But the an angels can't be crucified because they don't have bodies, um, and so in, in some why you know Christ was appearing as a seraph, or Christ appearing through a seraph, and uh, as he he contemplated this, the the you know the the grace of of having this this apparition, and also the 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 divine secrets that were revealed to him, and how it was that that, that a seraph could be who is who doesn't have a body could be be crucified and be suffering. Um, he had the 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 wounds of Christ impressed on on his body. Uh, and so, for the, the for the last two years of his life, he he had the the stigma. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, comes the end of his life. Uh, when he was dying, he wanted to be brought back here, uh, to die where to end where he had begun uh, near the the Porciuncula. No, as you're, so, if you haven't found it yet, if is your you're facing the, the Porziuncula chapel. No, so you, you come in, you walk up to the Porziuncula, then uh, behind it, on, on the right, there's a little chapel which marks the place where uh, where St. Francis died. And uh, there are many things that could be recounted about his death. He, he wanted to be, be laid on the, on the ground uh, in, in his humility, despite uh, all that he was suffering from his illness. Uh, and he wanted to die, to die poor. Uh, uh, you know, he would have preferred. Well, yeah, he, he asked to just be laid there naked, as as uh, you know, he'd come into the world with nothing, so he would leave the world with nothing. Uh, but <clears throat> one of the, the the superior there didn't think that was was a a, a good idea, and, and so he he ordered him to to uh, to take a, a habit and and and. A, Allow a habit to be put on him, and so uh, out of out of humility, Francis was willing to be clothed in clothes that were not his own, because at least you know, it's not his, and so uh, and so really he is leaving the world with nothing. Uh, and then you know, Saint Francis goes in in glory. So we see see the the body of Saint Francis at the bottom, and the the soul of Saint Francis in glory at the at the top of the picture. Uh, as he's on his way. Uh, to heaven, he, he stops to see a couple of people. Uh, he appeared to to Fra Augustino, or brother Augustino, who is the minister of the the province of Naples, uh, and the, he was uh, he was dying, and so this Fra Fra, uh, Fra Augustine was was dying, and uh, he, as he was dying, he he lost the ability to to speak because he was in such bad condition. But then, at a certain point, he, he sat up and said, "Wait for me, Father. I'm coming with you." And and they they later found that that was the time when when Saint Francis had died. Uh, and Saint Francis also appeared to to Bishop Guido of Arezzo, who was at that time uh, on Mount Saint Mike, uh, you know, on the mountain with the the shrine of Saint Michael that's near San Giovanni Rotondo, near near Padre Pio. 
and although Padre Pio obviously wasn't there yet, and uh, said to him, Lo, I'm going up to heaven. So on the on the left we have the, the friar dying and reaching out and saying, I'm going with you, Father, and on the on the on the right we have the, the bishop who, who also receives a visit from Francis. So after Francis died, they they, they discovered the, the stigmata, which were, were hidden during his life. Only a, a few of the, the friars who were closest to him uh, knew anything about it. And uh, so they, they examined his body and they also uh, took sworn testimony. Uh, no, since this was an extraordinary thing, they decided to, to, to have a notary act and, and uh, get all the, the dozens of, of witnesses who'd been at the examination of the body uh, to swear that they had seen these, these, uh, these wounds on, on Francis. And so uh, if you've seen you know, photos of the stigma of, of Padre Pio, there he, there's, there's just a wound in his hands. But the ones that St. Francis had were different. He had actually nails. Um, and so there was something black that, that went through his hand, and when you pushed on one side, it came out on the other. So it seemed to go all the way through, but it was made of flesh. It wasn't made of, of, of uh, metal. So something that obviously he, he couldn't make on his own. Um, and so you know, a clear sign that it was the, the, the finger of God that, that had done this. Uh, that had, you know, so you know, remember what I said before about, about mystical phenomena showing us with the senses what's going on in someone's soul. So this, you know, so St. Francis was in his soul uh, profoundly conformed to Christ crucified uh, and wanted to live a, a crucified life in, in everything, uh, offer his sufferings. He wanted to die like Christ. His desire for martyrdom wasn't met with literal martyrdom, but it was met with the gift of the, of the stigma of it of uh, conforming him outwardly uh, to Christ as he'd been conformed inwardly. So we also have another rude screen here with uh, the, no, Our Lady and then the, the angel to, uh, bringing the Annunciation. So they, they seem to be doing that. They're having this uh, verification of the, the stigma of the, the uh, in the, uh, yeah, in a church. So uh, I didn't talk much about Saint Clair, but you know, she because well the, the paintings of her are in her basilica and not in the, in the basilica of, of Saint Francis. Um, but uh, yeah, she had had followed Saint Francis. She wanted to to live a similar kind of life, but but adapted uh, to what religious life was for women in that time, uh, which was only uh, cloistered life. And so she, she followed the rule of St. Francis, adapted to, to cloistered nuns. And uh, St. Francis would go to visit her occasionally, but, but not as often as, as, uh, as she liked, because he didn't want to give uh, an example to the friars of being too familiar with, with nuns, lest, lest some kind of temptation arise. Uh, so the nuns, uh, so St. Francis's body is, is brought to the nuns before it's, it's buried, and the, the nuns mourn over, over St. Francis, over having lost uh, their father, their spiritual father. And then we have the, the canonization of St. Francis. So uh, St. Francis comes to... Uh, So, so the Pope comes to, to canonize St. Francis just uh, a couple of years after his death. Uh, he orders uh, the friars to, to collect money and build a basilica. The friars wouldn't, don't really, aren't supposed to have money, um, but he, he, he makes an, the Pope makes an exception to this because they'll need money in order to be able to, to build uh, a church worthy of, of St. Francis. So then they build this church uh, on, uh, on two levels with uh, the lower basilica and, the, and then the upper basilica above it. And then these, these uh, frescoes go to, to decorate the upper basilica. So then oh, after, so a after the death and canonization of St. Francis, then we have a, a series of, of other miracles. So St. Francis continuing to, to work from heaven. Uh, so Pope Gregory the Ninth begins to, to doubt what he's been told about the stigma. It can't really be true. Some, not, some, nothing like this has ever been known to happen. 
Um, now how can it be that someone who I, I personally knew has been, been favored by God in such an unheard of way? Uh, so he begins to, to doubt it, and, and St. Francis appears to him in a, in a dream, and he fills a, a vial with, with blood from his side and leaves the, the vial to the, the Pope. So then the Pope has the, the proof, you know, via this dream that then becomes reality, uh, of uh, that the, the stigmata are, are really something that happened. Uh, so here's one of the, one of the, the there's a, a long list of miracles performed by St. Francis. And there's this man in, in, in Nerida in, in Spain. And uh, so uh, he was very ill. Uh, the doctors had said there was nothing more that could be done. Uh, and so you see the wa doctors walking out of the room. Uh, but on the, on the right, St. Francis appears uh, accompanied by two angels and St. Francis heals the man. And so being instantly healed instead of dying, uh, that's a, a great miracle that... Uh, and there's the, not only does he help people who are dying, he even has been known to help people who are dead. So and this woman died in, in mortal sin, she ought to have gone to hell. Uh, but thanks to the, the intercession of St. Francis, she comes back to life long enough to confess. I got uh, this man was uh, was locked up under charges of heresy. He was uh, accused of, of heresy uh, and uh, given to the the bishop of, of Tivoli to, to to for safekeeping. And so the the bishop has him has him locked up in a, in a prison. Uh, but the, the man is, is innocent, and, and he prays to Saint Francis, and uh, then they they find him with the, the chains having fallen off of him. Uh, so by this miracle, his innocence is proved, and, and he's released. Um, so that's the, the end of the presentation. Um, and now I can, I can take some questions if you have some questions. So you were asking what the, the basis for the frescoes was. The, the basis is, is specifically uh, what's called the, the major legend of, of, uh, of St. Bonaventure. So, you know, to us, legend gets, sort of gives the idea of something that's not really true. But uh, what, what legend actually means is, is uh, something that is to be read. So this was the, what was to be read about the life of the saint. It's the official life of the saint that the Franciscans prepared, that St. Bonaventure prepared, uh, interviewing uh, people who, uh, interviewing priors who had known him, and, and correcting some things in the in the previous official biography that weren't actually accurate, like the when Thomas of Chalana wrote his biography, he, he exaggerated the the sins of Saint Francis, uh, because Saint Francis was always going around talking about his sins. But then when you went to 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 dig into it, to talk to people who'd known him before his conversion, he hadn't really done anything particularly bad. He was worldly, but he he wasn't committing any kind of, of mortal sins or anything like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, this, this uh, life of St. Francis written by, by St. Bonaventure, so written by a saint, so we can we have to be able to trust the honesty of a saint, uh, it is, is based on, on the, the prior sources, on, on what had been collected uh, in, in writing, and also uh, on interviewing people who, talking with people who, who had known uh, St. Francis and had been present at these things. And then, of course, there was a whole list of miracles that they'd collected for his canonization, testimonies about miracles, and then there's a, a, a version of these which is an appendix to the life of St. Francis. Well, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we hear in the past about people bilocating and levitating and, and seeing into people's consciences and, and so forth. Is there anyone who does that today? Well, I mean, St. Pio would be the obvious recent example, who is who's recent enough that, that there are still people alive who, who knew him. Um, uh, I, I don't know if there's someone around today bilocating and reading people's consciences. I've, I've heard of, of people who are, are said to be able to read other people's consciences. In the church, we sort of get things with a with a delay because we have to wait for people to, uh, in in order to be to be really sure of it, and, uh, to be sure that it's 
we normally have to wait for someone to, to die and then a cause of canonization to start and, and investigations to happen. Uh, often these kinds of investigation, detailed investigations and proofs uh, don't exist for someone who's alive, but, but occasionally you hear about someone, uh, I mean, I've heard about people tell me that, you know, that there's a friar in this, in, in, in this city who, who's, who's able to read people's hearts. Well, yeah, um, but, you know, before I, I tell you that's, a, that's something certain, I, I wait for the, the church to, to investigate it and to, to decide about it. But, but certainly St. Pioche is reasoned enough for there to be, be photos and, and things like that. Uh, okay, so you find on the internet different ideas and concepts. Do you mean just of being Franciscans or do you mean of, of religious life in general? The, in general, I mean, as you prepare the order of this order of the Dominican. Yeah. Like some yeah, well, you can think of, uh, of saints as being something like stained glass windows. Right. Uh, so, you know, the the life of Christ is is too rich to be completely reproduced by by any one one person, um, and so a, as a stained glass window, you know, all, all the light that you see in the stained glass window, all those colors were there in the white light that was coming from the sun, or the yellowish light that was coming from the sun, uh, but you didn't see it that way because you couldn't see all the light at once, uh, and so what the the saints do is to show us. Uh, parts or, or aspects of, of what there is in, in Christ, uh, and so, uh, uh, so you know, the, the the Franciscans, uh, you know, f try to, to imitate uh, Christ's poverty. They they have a, a love of the cross. Uh, they they have a you know, particular devotion to Our Lady, which is especially oriented toward the, the Immaculate Conception, but but not limited to it. Uh, you know the, the Dominicans have have the are, have a vocation which is is similar to to the Franciscans, but they have more of a focus on on study and on preaching. And at least originally, uh, Dominicans were only priests, uh, whereas the the, the 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 Dominican brothers or Dominican co the, their their religious brothers were Dominican cooperators who weren't technically part of the the Dominican order, uh, and. Whereas, you know, on the other hand, you know, the Franciscans aiming for, for humility uh, and not having a, a vocation to preach, but not intending that everyone who is a Franciscan preaches, they, they have, they, uh, lay brothers were, were a part of the Franciscans from the very beginning. Um, then we have the Jesuits who, who didn't uh, want to be religious at all um, because the, the idea, the, the kind of religious life that there was before uh, them wasn't some, wasn't what they felt to be felt called to, and so they invented uh, basically the Pope wanted them to become religious, and so they basically invented a new kind of religious life that was different from from religious life before that. And so other religious uh, pray in common, uh, you no know, pray the office together, but the the Jesuits all pray individually like like uh, secular priests do. Uh, and so the Jesuits don't really have a, a, any kind of liturgical tradition and, and generally don't have a lot of appreciation for liturgy. Whereas then on the other end of the extreme, you have the Benedictines who, who liturgy is, is a fundamental part of their, their spiritual life. Um, and, uh, so, so basically all these different uh, religious orders, different, uh, and also saints who aren't, who, who aren't founders of religious orders are showing us different aspects of Christ's life, uh, different aspects of what there is in, in Christianity that uh, you can't see looking at the whole thing, like you can't see all the colors. You can't see any colors when you look at white light, but white light is made of all the colors. Uh, and so they're sort of breaking out and focusing on different aspects of, of, of what there is. Uh, and so this is why St. Francis wanted to go to the, to the Pope to get approval for his form of life. To, to, to get the Pope to say, is this an authentic way of following Christ? And the Pope said yes. So that's, uh, so, but there are many different authentic ways of following Christ. Yes, right. So there's only one faith, but there can be many religious orders because it's, because what Christianity is, is, is too rich for any one person to live.
Uh, yes, well, the internet being a, an exchange of, of ideas, yeah, obviously there, there's everything there, good, bad, and, and indifferent. Uh, so far as I, I, I never heard anything about, about the father changing his idea about Francis. So I, I don't know what happened to the father. I think he, he just sort of disappears from the story. So I don't know if that's because he, he died not long after, and, and so he didn't have a chance to see what Francis became, or, or if he was always convinced that, that he was the only one who really understood that his son was crazy and other people were just deluded. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. He kind of disappears from the story. Okay, so your question is, what attracted people to, to St. Francis? Why did he? so many people follow him? Why is he known throughout the world, even by people who... Uh, yeah, he's he's a saint that's that's attractive even to, you know, outside the Catholic Church, uh, even outside of, of Christianity. Um, yeah, I, I think fundamentally he just gives an idea of of authenticity, of of not being in it for any benefit of his own. Someone who who's who's sincerely looking for good and looking for God. Um, and not especially because of the, the poverty and humility that he embraced. Um, so people, you know, in St. Francis's time, people were looking for, for, for poverty. Uh, that is, they, 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 were, they were thinking that Christ was poor, and here we have this church, and this church is rich, and it's got all kinds of things. And there are, people, there are these, these uh, bishops who are living you know, with, with all this money, and uh, here there, there are poor people starving. So, you know, is, is this church really following Christ? And this led to, to movements that uh, wanted, to embrace, wanted to embrace poverty, uh, especially for others. Um, that is, they wanted the church to become poor, uh, and they wanted the church to, to give up I its wealth, uh, and uh, basically called the church hypocritical if it had, uh, had money. Uh, but you know the, the the problem with and and so these movements turned into into heretical movements that also started doing things like rejecting the sacraments, um, and uh, yeah. so and also went off in other bad directions. But uh, there was this this desire for something poor and, and authentic at that time. And, and a sense that the church ought to be poor in some way. And St. Francis was doing this not by telling other people to change, but by changing himself, which is really the, the authentic way to, to put things right. Um, and, and so St. Francis himself embraced poverty, but he didn't tell other people they had to become poor. Uh, but he, he convinced them by his example to follow them into poverty and into being, being more like Christ. So the church has money because if it doesn't have money, it can't help people. Uh, the church can't help the poor if it doesn't have money to, to give them. It can't build hospitals. It can't uh, take care of orphans. Uh, all of these things require money. But it doesn't necessarily require money for, for one man to walk, to go around and preach. And so that's what St. Francis was doing. So you're, you're saying that you know, the, the, you know, Franciscans, you know, the Franciscan movement was, was uh, was great. It led to it expanded uh, widely. It it brought, gave us lots of saints, um, but it didn't save us from the the, the Protestants. Um, yes, well, this is fundamental. I mean, th this is fundamentally the you know the, the the problem with with Christianity is that everyone has to live it. Um, and so it's not enough for there to be saints in order to make the church not need reform. Everyone has to reform himself. And where people do not reform themselves, then uh, tensions develop and, and people sort of recognize that the church needs to reform, but because they don't start by reforming themselves, they, they wind up destroying things. Uh, and that's what happened with, with, with Luther and, and, uh, and the others. So, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I mean that, that's that's sort of fundamentally the thing. I mean, in, in the response to the to the to the Protestants and trying to to go uh, clean up the mess that had been made by by people not living their their Catholic life and thereby giving 
uh, creating a need for reform that was left unfilled. Uh, the two religious orders that, that helped the most in that were the Jesuits and, and the Capuchins. And the Capuchins uh, obviously are a branch of Franciscans. So the Franciscans did have something to do with, with putting things right. Um, but obviously we still have Protestants to this day. And the Jesuits were in a way founded to, to, to sort out the problem with the, the Protestants, but, but you know, didn't succeed. That's why the, the, uh, the Dominicans teased the, the, the Jesuits. Because the Dominicans were, 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 were founded to, to eliminate the problems with the, the Albigensian heretics. Uh, and there aren't any Albigensian heretics anymore. Yeah, so you're asking if, if like divisions of, of different kind, if diff having different kinds of spirituality in the church aren't, aren't creating differences, divisions like there are between Catholics and Protestants. And, and basically the, the answer to this comes back to, to the point that I was making before about Christianity being too rich for any one person to live all of it. Um, and so, you know, our, our unity as Christians doesn't mean that we all have to have the exactly the same kind of spiritual life and be attracted principally to the to the same mysteries of our Lord's life, or or, uh, or of our you know, principally to, to certain mysteries of the faith regarding you know, Jesus or the, the the Blessed Sacrament or uh, care for the sick. I mean, you no know, no one can can spend his life dedicated entirely to prayer and at the same time be out caring for, for the sick and the poor. Um, you, have to, you have to pick because we can't materially do everything that, that Christ calls uh, Christians generally to do. Uh, and so you know, we can have uh, different spirituality, different focuses, but a unity in, in faith, a unity in having the same sacraments, a unity in, in all uh, obeying uh, one hierarchy, one pope. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so the, the uh, I guess the problems in the church then were, were that uh, there was no such thing as a, as a seminary. Seminaries were, were invented by the Council of Trent. Um, so the, the, the country priests didn't necessarily know much of anything. Uh, and therefore, you know, they, they managed to, to, to read the mass in, in Latin and, and say the breviary but no one had taught them any theology. Uh, so what they, they knew about the faith was what they'd learned from their parents and maybe from, from uh, a couple of other priests they'd talked to, uh, but they didn't have any kind of, of formal knowledge, and so they, they made uh, theological mistakes in things that they said. Uh, then we have people who, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there was a kind of a, a strong union between church and, and state <laughs> which uh, has its advantages and also has its disadvantages. And one of the, the disadvantages was that uh, a bishopric or, an ab or, or being a bishop or an abbot was a, a good way for, for nobles to, uh, to, to set up one of their, their younger sons in a good life where he'd be taken care of. Um, but obviously someone who, who's sort of just given the job because he'll have an income that way uh, is not committed to holiness. And if bishops are not committed to, to holiness, then uh, they're not going to be a good example to their diocese. So you had, had ignorance in the, in the lower clergy, and you had um, basically a, a lack of commitment to spiritual life in the, in the upper clergy. Uh, and this is, the sort of, of, uh, this is the sort of circumstance that created uh, sort of a search for, for something else that, that often ended in, in embracing some kind of heresy. So I mentioned the, the Albigensian heretics who were uh, uh, very strong in, in, in France. Uh, they were basically a variant of the, of the Manichees, that there's, that uh, you know, matter is, is, is evil, uh, and so uh, we should do, do penance and live an ascetic of life and not marry. Uh, because because matter is evil, because marriage is, is therefore evil, because it makes more material bodies. Uh, and so spirit good, matter evil, was made something that sort of resembled Christian asceticism, but was not at all Christian, uh, <clears throat> and did not even... It was the sort of er error that had been around for, for many, many centuries in one form or another. Um, one of the reasons why... 
uh, well, yeah, that, that's maybe, maybe too much of a, of a tangent, but uh, yeah, these are sort of the, the sorts of problems. The others were, were not uh, on the Albigensian side of the heretics, but like the, the pauperist heretics that I mentioned before, uh, that uh, sort of wanted to, to make the church poor uh, by taking away its money, uh, which was kind of nice for them. But not but meant that the church could not. Uh, well, yeah, the church had been had been given an, an income so that it could uh, devote this income to, to to serving the the people. And so, without that income, it it loses the the possibility of doing a lot of of good works. Um, obviously, you know, a, a bishop who becomes a bishop because that was the the best life that his, his father, his noble father, could could uh, could give for him is is. Not necessarily, I mean, he might not be a bad person, but he's probably a sort of worldly person who's not too interested in helping the poor, even though he kind of feels, if they get into desperate conditions, he may help them, but he's going to make sure he's taken care of personally first. And so that was the kind of problem that there was in the, in the church at that time. It's not one of the greatest crises of the church, but certainly something was needed. And so St. Francis on the one hand and St. Dominic on the other uh, were called to, to, to renew the church, as people are called to renew the church in, in, in every age. <laughs>